Hey everyone, welcome back to Besties Books and Brews. Hello. Hey. As you can see, we have a new look. We went darker. We were <laughs> we were thinking for Halloween, but I think we're gonna keep this. I I really like the black. I think it's I yeah, do too. Yeah. More eye appealing than the pink, in my yeah. opinion. Agreed. Mm -hmm. So today we are super excited and fangirling a little bit <laughs> because we are interviewing the author of Pucking Around, Miss Emily Rash. Ooh, I'm Ooh. so excited. <laughs> and in honor of that, she's from Jacksonville and she writes the Jacksonville Rays. So since there is a brewery there, this is the brew of the night. Bye bye. Gotta love it. Gotta nice. love it. Sarah's drinking for all of us. Yes. <laughs> so everyone, stay tuned and let's take it away to the interview. Right, cool. So again, thank you so much for joining us. We are so very excited to have you on with us. So just a little background about our podcast. We are four best friends. We absolutely love reading. We have been reading for as long as we can remember. And We've been talking about it with each other. And we just thought, hey, why not create a podcast where we talk about it with each other? So yeah. that's how it began. So I am Alyssa. I'm Nikki. I'm Sarah. And I'm Lori. Hello, everyone. I'm Emily. <laughs> Hi, Emily. <laughs> so we did uh, prepare some questions for you. We have a lot. Okay. Of, um, so we'll get started right on it uh i know you just mentioned university teaching so mm -hmm. one of our very first questions first of all congratulations on the move to writing a full-time author yeah. so we wanted to know like first of all what made you initially start writing while teaching if you mm -hmm. had like a goal in mind that when i hit this milestone i'm going to move to full-time writer and what was that milestone that made you make that move yeah, so I um I started writing honestly more than me really having an eye to publish. I started writing because I was bored. Um I had always been a writer like when I was younger, you know, like uh, writing was always writing and reading were always my two loves, my two passions. Like I was always, you know, head in a book or, you know, the kid that would like write short stories for funsies, you know. Got like a perfect score on my senior portfolio and got like the worst pizza party you could ever imagine for it. <laughs> Um, like one of like four people in my state or something that got like a perfect score and so oh, I always cool. loved to write yeah well I mean it was Kentucky so it's like the bar was low but <laughs> so, um got a perfect score um but no I love to write and uh yeah so I was I, I was living in Malawi of all places in southern Africa and um I was working on my dissertation and Malawi is just kind of like where it sits on the globe <laughs> means that it gets dark really early at night, like regardless of the season. So like around six, six thirty, it's like black dark at night. Um, and for me being a night owl, it's like, well, so everyone goes inside at night and like you stay inside because of malaria or whatever, you know, so it's like you don't go outside. So you're just in your house. You often don't have electricity. And I was a starving grad student. So even if I did have electricity, I could not afford internet. Internet is incredibly expensive in Malawi. And so I was like, well, I'm this night owl that's going to be up in the dark for the next, you know, seven hours. If I'm thinking I'm not going to go to bed till like 1 a.m. So I was like, what am I going to do? I can't afford to like hang out and watch Netflix. And there's not much else to do. <laughs> so I started writing just to like entertain myself. I started writing stories and it kind of went from there. Once I really started to write it and started to like, I actually finished it and was like, this could be something. And at that point I was really, my, my idea was that I only wanted to pursue traditional publishing. I, I carried all of like the shitty ideas that you hear from people like, oh, self-publishing is not real publishing. If you were really an author, you would have made it. You know, like all the right. shitty things yeah. that you hear that, is, but I didn't know any better. I didn't actually know what I was talking about. I had never researched self-publishing. I just knew what I had heard. So it was like traditional publishing or bust. And so I slogged along in that for a couple of years so that would have been like 2017 I was writing and finishing books putting them into the query trenches trying to go through that trad process by the time the pandemic hit I had finished my PhD I was university teaching 
and just needed to feel some joy. So it's like I was in the query trenches with one of my projects. It was going well. I think at that point I was, I had like a revise and resubmit with an agent. Um, but the pandemic hit and I was just like, I want to write something that's just for me. You carry a lot of stress, like when you're doing the trad stuff, because it's just like a lot of hurry up and wait and everything feels out of your control. And so then a pandemic hits and then everything really feels out of your control. <laughs> and so I'm like, what's something I can control? I can write a book that's just for me and I can publish it. Um, and so that's what I did. And I wrote uh, Beautiful Things, which was my Why Choose uh, Regency romance, uh, published that. And then it just kind of snowballed from there. Within two years, I had written and published eight books and self-published them. Wow. Um, and the question that you had asked is like, at what point did I know that I was going to quit teaching? And I think it's hard. You don't really, I, I never had like a number in mind. Like once I, once I recoup my salary from the one, I'll quit the other or anything like that. Right. It was more of just a, for me, it was a feeling. It all hit very suddenly in the spring of like, I was, I was going full force with both. I was university teaching full-time. I was being an author full-time. So I would be nine to five at the university, try and be home and present with my family and my kid from like six to 8.30. Then I was in this chair from like 8.30 till one, two, 3 a.m. Wow. And that was every day. That was every day because the being a self-published author, being a full-time author everything is on me. The work, the work feels insurmountable and I already had a full-time job. So more than me being like the money is going to do it. Ultimately I did have to have the money to be able to stop the university teaching, but more than anything, it was the feeling of like, I'm going to burn out. Right. I, I would talk about like, I am going to collapse inward like a dying star <laughs> if yeah. I keep going at this pace. Um, so the money made it easier for me to finally let go, but it was really hard. It was very much a grieving process I went through in the spring because um, I loved it and it was my identity and it's what I had worked for for 15 years. Right. So it, it's yeah. hard to just be like, see ya, yeah. you know, it was, mm -hmm. like it was my tenure year, like oh, I wow. oh, my wow. tenure year and I'm just like, it just felt like I like I, go me sports romance, sports metaphor. I've told people it's like, it felt like, like Super Bowl. And I'm at like the 10 yard line and I just put the football down and I'm just like, see ya. I'm just going to walk away and go right smut. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of how it felt. I'm just like, like it, that was that part of me. That's like, what are you doing? This is your job. This is what you've worked for, for so long. And just be like, no, no, I'm going to go do this other thing. Wild, wild, um, unexpected, lovely unexpected wild yeah, yeah it was amazing life takes you very in very unexpected directions. yeah yeah <laughs> well talking about fucking wild um sarah and i actually were on the art team and we absolutely loved it 15 out of 10 it was <laughs> amazing um but yeah i i she sarah actually introduced me i don't know about everybody else but she introduced me to your writing and I absolutely mm -hmm. fell in love with it as soon as I started reading it so kudos to you on that oh, thank you yeah we thought the arc you know we understand you had to make changes but we were like yeah. this is the actual best yes but most perfect book we've ever read it was so raw and real yes. and the yeah so thank, thank you, you. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. It was it was a hard process. I think with everything, you know, I've talked about it in different places and other lives and in my Facebook group, you know, when I've when I've been trying to un, trying to make sense, it's hard for even me to make sense of how much change has hit me all at once. And I really appreciate one of my readers that talked about it in the sense of like change trauma. And even when it's good things change is still traumatic. So like, yeah. even when it's, you have a baby, like you can be excited for that and happy for that. Right. It's still fucking traumatic, you Absolutely. know, <laughs> like to yeah. have that life change. So it's like, whether it's good things, new jobs or new moves or whatever. So it's like, you can have good and wonderful and exciting things and life-changing things happening to you, but it's still a trauma. And so I think for me to just, it's just been like a deluge of change, good and bad and indifferent, but just change, you know? Right. Um, and it really rocked me. It really rocked me. And, and this summer was hard. And then I was writing with Tess, what you have as a person going through so much change 
So her change was different than mine, but it was just like, whoa, like I just kind of felt like, like I'm in this spinning chair of like, whoa, this is hard to write. Yeah. Um, but no, I'm, I'm really glad with the way that it's been received and, um, it, it's hard. It was, I was very anxious about trying to do a follow-up volume to Pucking Around just because of how popular Pucking Around was. And it's just like, it, it's so hard because you don't want to just write the same thing again. And that's right. what I kept trying to like tease to my readers of like, it's not going to be the same thing because there are authors out there that do write pretty much the same book over mm -hmm. and over and over again. They just change the trope slightly, you know, um, yeah. But I'm like, this is going to be wildly different. This is a different <laughs> dynamic, different group of people, different point in their lives. Yes. And so I'm so grateful to my readers that were like, we get it. We're on board. Like, we're not <laughs> asking you to rewrite Pucking Around, you know, <laughs> even though there have people that have been saying that. <laughs> They're like, just give us more of them forever. Stop yeah. your other books. <laughs> no, I literally messaged Sarah and I'm just like, did Emily go through my journals? Like, this is me. I am Tess. And Tess yeah. is I. I mean, yeah. it was it was absolutely amazing because I feel like, especially with her relationship with uh, Rachel, they just had that real relationship, like that sister relationship. Mm -hmm. There is like no holds bar. I'm going to tell mm -hmm. you how it is, whether you like it or not. And mm -hmm. I absolutely love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what I was running into a bit and I like I was already doing it with Shelby. It's so like why I think the edit was important. But I, I think there's something that we still aren't confronting enough in I don't know whether it's like popular culture or like in the romance books that we read of like everyone wants their FMC to be so goddamn likable and then they also want them to not be like the it girl like right. don't she can't be a pick me and she can't be I'm not like the other girls and she can't be blah 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 but she has to be likable and she can't have flaws and she can't be a bitch and she can't, you know, so it's like, it's really hard. So then to shift it and to have it be not Rachel's book anymore and Rachel be like, girl, what are you doing? And telling right. her friend how like it is. And I had all this reader pushback of like, I hated Rachel in this and she was mean and she wasn't supportive and she wasn't whatever. But I was just kind of, I don't, it felt authentic to me in the headspace I was in at the moment, but it made me really reflective. And I, I've gotten feedback on some of my other books as well. And I've talked with some of my author friends that they've been getting feedback about that of like, we, we really try and make our women be able to do it all. And then we're so critical about them. And it's hard. It's almost, it almost starts to feel like impossible. Like that's why I have so much fun writing men is because the women <laughs> start to feel impossible to write. Cause it's like, God, you can't please everyone. You can't make her too likable. You can't make her too funny. You can't mm -hmm. make her too sassy. You can't make her too, you know, I'm going to stand up for myself. Cause right. then you're like, boo, now she's annoying, you know? So it's like how you find a way to fit your females into these little boxes that readers will be like, yes, I liked her, you know? Um, it's tough. It's tough, tough. It is. But yeah. I, I made it through the summer. I made it through the edit that I did. I'm happy with where I ended up, um, with the book. I'm excited to write the next ones in the series and yeah. Fun We're time. excited to read them. <laughs> yes, yes. <we> are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've got, um, I'll do, I I'm doing some edits on a, on a trad pub book right now that I'm really super excited about. Hopefully I'll be able to talk more about that soon. Um, and then I'm going to do, I'm going to crank out, uh, the next volume of Pucking Ever After. I hope to get that out around November. Um, and then, yeah, it'll be full steam ahead waiting for and prepping for, um, Pucking Sweet, which will be Poppy's book. Um, and that should be a ton of fun. <laughs> so my question to you is what is your writing process like? It's strange. I mean, I've only, I've only been doing it full time and only this full time, uh, since like May and that was over the summer and over the summer I had my kid with me and so it really because a lot of people ask me it's like well now it must change it must change because now the day job is gone so this can become your day job so you won't write at night anymore but I had my kid all right. summer and I did the, you know I only had him in a like a special math like mathlete program for like half of the month of June. And so it was like, well, really no, because I, I would try and work a bit during the day, but part of it too is like, he's bored, he's bored and he wants to swim and he wants to have a summer. And so I really didn't change anything with my schedule. Um, and I, I have, I've, it's changed a bit now that he's in school, but 
typically what I do. I do my best writing in the evening. Um, and that has been a product of just training my brain to do that with that was the way my schedule worked. And now I find that I just really do enjoy it. I enjoy kind of less distractions out on the street. I enjoy kind of the dark and the quiet of my, my room. So I tend to be the most productive between like nine and one in the morning. Um, I do most of my like social media stuff in the mornings. So you have better light, you know, yeah. um, and I tend to, you know, like shower and look more presentable in the morning. So then, you know, by the evening, I'm like in my writer <laughs> cape. Um, but yeah, I I do I do like admin work and social media work in the mornings. And then I write in the evenings. I would say my writing process, um, I can really be inspired by anything. Um, it can be like a song that hooks me in and I start to develop like a character or an idea around a song. It can be pictures. Sometimes if I'm just like trolling the internet or like on Pinterest or something, um, it can be an idea, a scene can hit me, you know? Um, I kind of joke, I'll tend to think about it of like projects are in different parts of my head. So like I know in a podcast, you can't tell, but it's like, <laughs> it's like if it's sitting in the back of my head, it's like, she's not coming out. She's not coming out anytime soon. It may just be like, oh, wouldn't it be fun to write a thing about a vampire? Like, and it'll <laughs> sit back there. And it's like the projects that are ready to move forward in my head will start to move forward and they'll start to flesh themselves out more. And I'll start to be like leaving more notes on my phone for, you know, oh, what if I named the town they're in this? Or like, oh, he has a sister named this, you know? And so you just start to build it out. And I I know when I'm ready to like start writing, I I say that it's like they're haunting me. Like if I have the characters in my head talking to each other in full sentences, quipping with each other, like I have like, like I'm laughing at the things they're saying to each other in my head. I'm like, stop, like this is enough now. It has to get out, you know? And so, you know, like put it on the page. Um, and, and once I'm in that state, that that's a really fun state to be in where they feel, because my imagination is like very cinematic. Um, so when they feel so alive to me that they're literally just like hanging out, talking to each other and like teasing each other in my head, that's a really fun space to be in. And I, I, I know, like, I know them enough to pull them out. Right. Um, so like I got to write a bonus scene for, uh, pucking around and I hadn't, I hadn't been inside Jake and Caleb's head in a while. And so it's like, it had been probably like two months since I had written something in their perspective. And it's so fun, you know, cause it's like, <laughs> I just like sit down at my computer and I just have to like pull them out of my head, you know, and be like, all right, <laughs> we're going to set them on the couch and they're going to do an interview with ESPN and let them go, you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> but it was so fun. And so to feel like, yeah, I know when the characters are ready, when it's, when it feels that easy to be like, let's pluck them out of my head, put them on a couch and just let them go. And I'm just going to write down what they're saying as they sit on the couch together. It's a, it's a strange kind of imagination. Your brain sounds like a really fun place to be. For yeah. real. <laughs> it's fun. It's fun. It's crowded. It's crowded. Um, a question I'll often get is like, what do I read? Or like, what do I watch like while I'm writing? And that's actually a really hard part of my process is like, because things get so crowded and like, I'll, I'll get really in my head. So like, even, you know, like my, my husband will come in and talk to me and it'll be like, I won't register he's there. That's how deep in the hole I can get. So that, that can be fun to live with me, you know, <laughs> but, but no, like when I, when I'm working on a project and I'm that deep into it, I can't start anything new. I can't like consume new media. I can't let, I can't get distracted by a new story. So like I'll rewatch old, old things or I'll reread old things. So it has felt like pretty much for a year because I've been on so many writing deadlines. I feel like I haven't really read anything new in like a year um, because I can't, I can't like turn off that part of my brain mm -hmm. right. to let myself enjoy something new. Cause it's like, no, I'm, I'm trapped, you know? Yeah. Having yeah. Jake in your head must be awesome though. Cause how oh, yeah. funniest <laughs> characters ever yeah he he's actually I've I've said before he is my most and my least favorite character to write in the in the Jack's Rays universe possibly out of all of my characters 
because he he has ADHD and he has anxiety. Um, and I don't have either of those things. And so, but I, I've written him because it's very close. Like I was going through, you know, basically the story with my son of doing his ADHD diagnosis and getting him on medication and seeing the night and day difference and everything and his ability to focus and everything, you know? Um, but yeah, to write Jake, he would be the one where, cause I tend to write linearly. So it's like, I'll start at the beginning and I end at the end. Um, so if I know that it's a Jake chapter, there would be days where I'd be like, I'm not feeling it. I can't, I can't get inside his head because his, his chapters tend to be the longest of any of the chapters Mm -hmm. because he thinks everything, every emotion, every, you know, the energy that I need to be Jake is such a high energy. Um, and the chapters are longer and it's just that rapid fire. He thinks every thought that he has. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. Um, so it's fun when he's vibing. He's so fun to write. I love writing him because it's so, it's such a departure from me. Um, whereas like Ilmari is super easy for me to slip right inside of because he's mm. much quieter and sedate. His thoughts are short and clipped. He doesn't even do much reflection, like personal reflection. So it's very different to have Jake be like, I'm personally reflecting about every moment of my life, you know? <laughs> and Omari yeah. being like, there is no reflection. I'm not asked, I'm not thinking about that. Right. You know? mm-hmm. Very different vibes. So it's fun. Um, but very different. I remember one of one of the um one of the uh reviews that I got like an early review I got for pucking around was this person that was really frustrated and they were like it feels like four different people wrote this and it was like <laughs> like like maybe there maybe there's something to what they're saying in a different context but like the only thing I could come up with is like it's four POVs right. and they're very different people right. so I took it as a compliment <laughs> like yeah like, it feels like four people wrote it and I was like it was four people in the story I don't know like maybe what they meant was like I don't know like it could have been it could have been a criticism and a valid one but I just laughed it was like then I did it right if it feels like four different voices yeah yes yeah, exactly Agreed. It, it allowed us to get into the head right of four different people that's exactly yeah. what we loved about it it was yes. everybody was so different yeah I feel like now that you explain Jake I can relate the most oh to yeah. yeah yeah <laughs> Well, because it's funny because he, like over time, as the series has kind of built out, he he started as a favorite. And I think now he's a lot of people's least favorite. And overwhelmingly, the the criticism that gets, you know, put onto him is he's annoying. You know, like he's too much. He's too much. Yeah, but I have had I have had so many people reach out to me that they say I have ADHD and anxiety and I have never felt more seen than I have with Jake. It's true. Like, mm-hmm. It felt like he felt they're like, I've never read a first person POV that it felt like the inside of my own head, mm-hmm. you, know, you know? And yeah. so I was like, that was gratifying. It's like, so people that don't, that it, he is too much for some people, but sometimes people that are maybe unmedicated ADHD are too much for some people, you know? Yeah. 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 Um, yep. But yeah, I was like, all right, I, I see it. I can accept the criticism that he's too much for you. You probably find people with ADHD annoying in your regular life too. Like, mm-hmm. um, true, yeah. But yeah, I love him. <laughs> Same. He he's one of my favorites. Yeah. But I think we probably all can relate to the we're, ADHD yeah. and anxiety. Yeah. So yeah. we're all neurodivergent. We're all so. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. So Emily. On Besties Books and Brews, we always pick a brew. So for Jacksonville, since you guys have Ann Hauser Bush there, tonight's Bud Light. Okay, fun. (laughs) And we want to know, do you have a drink of choice when you're writing? I tend to do a cheap Chardonnay. Um, Mm -hmm. I do... I do Josh Chardonnay, which actually they keep raising the price on Josh. It used to be for Chardonnay. I I feel like it's gone up like three bucks. Um... And uh, yeah, Josh Chardonnay. I do some Kendall Jackson Chardonnay. Um, I will occasionally do a uh, gin and tonic. Um, it depends though on like how productive I need to be in the evening. Like there are some <laughs> nights where it's like, I can't do this unless I'm able to just kind of like slow sip a Chardonnay and take it easier. 
on nights like probably tonight when I hang up with you guys because I'm on deadline it's like this is just like a uh what's it called a LaCroix right so it, it, it's like <laughs> Because the wine can help me just kind of like take the edge off and calm mm-hmm. down and so yeah. have more like a casual evening of writing or editing. But when I need to be more of like, no, I'm going to be up till 1 a.m. and this is serious, <laughs> then I tend to not drink. Um, if anything, I tend to like snack. I'm a notorious. That's the problem with like being a late night writer is you become like a late night snacker. And so late night snacks are always like dessert. Like who thinks about eating carrot sticks at 1 a.m.? No you fun. think about eating like <laughs> M&Ms at 1 a.m., you know? Or Oreos. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Oreos, <laughs> yeah. So I need to like somehow trick my brain into being like, all right, if you're going to be a late night writer, you have to be a healthy snacker still. Like <laughs> we're going to throw some carrot sticks in there, but. <laughs> if you find the trick, please let us know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, my question is, uh, first off, I got to say, love the spicy scenes my oh. husband thanks you <laughs> tremendously oh, good. Good. um but where did you get the inspiration for your why choose spicy scenes and what kind of research did you do for them yeah yeah I get this question a lot um it's it's kind of a combination of like just having a good imagination there is certainly research that goes into it especially anytime I do anything that is like mm scenes I have I have done research uh, for those scenes, whether it's reading other books, reading uh, other MM romance books and getting inspired by some of the scenes that I see there, um, uh, watching, right? So like I do, I'll, I'll like watch porn scenes and things like that so that I can get, get you know, especially if you're in a wide choose scene where you're like, is that possible, right? Because that'll be <laughs> what, what people say is like, that's not possible. You can't. Right human body doesn't bend like that or whatever <laughs> I can be like I guarantee you it does right like uh, it's, it works you know um so yeah I try and I, I try to be very mindful though I try and think about um trying to present everything in a way that does make anatomical sense and does feel realistic um some of the fun like I people will ask like oh you know do I connect with everything that I put in my books and and I think I think as a reader or as a writer, you don't have to, right? So like, I don't, I don't have to be into all of the things that I put into my books, you know, or like, even if it's something like, I don't, I don't like the term daddy, even though I have daddy K in my book, it just fit in the moment. It came out in the moment and that's what works, but I don't like it. And in my own personal life, that would be an ick for me, you know? but it's not in the writing of it, you know? And so it, there, there's things that you can do or like kinks that they might explore that it's like, it's not my kink, but I'm having fun with it. And I think that's part of when the imagination, when the characters are so strong in your imagination that uh, one of the things I'll talk about is like, get out of their way, like let them be who they are. They're not me. So if they want to go and do something sexual, that's not my thing. I can get out of their way and let them just explore what they want to explore um, and use my imagination to fill in the gaps, especially if maybe it's something that I haven't tried, you know, Um, but I can use my imagination and just kind of get out of their way and be like, this is clearly what they want to do. I'm already putting it. (laughs) It's like, we're going with it. Um, But yeah, it's funny. It's funny. Sometimes the scenes that will pop in there, like the things that people will think are really spicy that will kind of like surprise me of like, I didn't really think it was that spicy, you know, or like, I think like, I'll think something else was spicy and people like read right past it, you know? So it's just kind of funny. It's funny what, what people like in spice and what they don't and what's acceptable on the page versus what you might see like in porn or something, you know, like I don't like if someone talked as much in a sex scene as they talk in romance books because it's totally different you know that would it would just be like shh you know, stop talking. <laughs> so that's another part of it of it's like god in the books it may like it's just bringing all the senses to life and it's bringing a dynamic you know imagination you know for the scenes but like if it was in real life i'd be like you have to stop talking you know? <laughs> so it's funny well do you have a favorite sex scene that you wrote um I think one of the first scenes that I really felt like, yes, like I felt like I had gotten into my groove of like, this is working for me. Um, And like, this, this is good. Like, I felt like it can be, you can be your own worst critic, but for me to be like, this is good spice. 
uh, it was actually in book one, my first, the first book I self-published, Beautiful Things, and it's Rosalie and Burke in the piano room. Um, and so it's like towards the end of the book. Um, and nothing extraordinary happens, nothing like ultra kinky happens. They're just like up against the piano and then they're kind of on the couch and then they're kind of on the floor. Um, but it was just me like really stretching those wings. It's the spiciest I had ever gone. It was the longest I had ever kept a door open, so to speak, and and been inside of a scene. And so that that one means a lot for me and my confidence to be like, yeah, this is working. I think I can do this. Um, <laughs> I think the funnest one that I've gotten like the most fan reaction and the most excitement about is probably chapter 55, 56 in Pucking Around, which is the, the infamous kitchen scene, right? Um, <laughs> first of many. Uh, but I think it's quickly being eclipsed for people. If you read Pucking Ever After, uh, mm-hmm. chapter two, Emergency Contact, yeah, um, has another kitchen scene in it. And that one was really <laughs> fun too. That was like a whole... That's like a multi-scene piece, chapter two, because like it starts in the kitchen and it's a very different vibe and a different conversation entirely is happening. And then it shifts on a dime and you're still in the kitchen and then it shifts again and they move locations. And then it shifts halfway through that as you're like, blah, you know, um, <laughs> so that's fun. I love, I love shifting POVs within a scene. Um, and, and so you're just like, you know, it can feel crazy to think like this was 8,000 words of spice <laughs> and three paragraphs long, or I mean, three, three chapters long, but we're shifting POVs. And I feel like it's in the group scenes, that's so much fun to see it from their different angles. And mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I joked that that was actually really hard about writing Tess and Ryan's book because I just had those two POVs. And, you know, I was joking about like, God, like I need I need someone to just like stand in the corner and like, <laughs> and, like, I, need, like I need a cat or I need a dog, you know, because like, you just want, you want that different perspective or like, you just want to be able to change angles. Um, and I couldn't, I was just stuck. I was like, Tess or Ryan, Tess or Ryan. And yes, yeah, so it's like, I still had a lot of fun, but it was very different to go from four to two. <laughs> <laughs> but that's on a scene. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. For that sauna scene. Yeah, yeah. The sauna scene was so much fun. So much fun. <laughs> I actually I was just at a con this weekend and I um the one of the sponsors of the con, it was guilt is called Guilty Pleasures. So it's like a big, it's like a you know, a sex store uh, in North Charleston. And um they were giving really good discount and everything. And so it was like six at night, and my PA and I both were like, if I go back to the hotel now. I'm going to fall asleep and then I'm going to like feel miserable because it's only six at night. And so we're like, well, what if we go over to this sex shop? <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> to think how things have changed that it's like, I was oh, yeah. a city professor and it's like, now I'm taking my employee to a sex <laughs> shop and being like, oh, no, get that discount. You know, <laughs> it's funny. But the whole point of that story is I found the Ryan. So the sex toy that inspired the Ryan, so like the cute little butt plug with the rhinestone heart in it and the remote and everything, they had one on the shelf. And so I was like, yes. And I took it and I got it. And I haven't, like, I haven't touched it yet. Nothing has happened to it. I think, I think I might give it, like do a giveaway and like oh. give away the Ryan. I can always get myself another one, but yeah. it like, it felt too good to be true that there was literally one left on the shelf and in like the color and the shape and the style of the Ryan um so I do have a Ryan here that's amazing <laughs> I love that <laughs> yeah. a lot of fun uh, two things from a reader point of view reader perspective we really appreciate the multiple point of views yes. during the sex scenes I love yeah. when it changes between characters that yeah. is my favorite thing and the other thing is love all the research you put into the why choose scenes because I know we've all had conversations before where like something's happening in a sex scene with four people involved and we're like, there's no way. But like you said, there, there's one we read where like the girl was upside down and we're there literally was no freaking trying way. to figure it out. Like, how yeah. Could... yeah, well, especially if you look at any any time you're doing anything that's like uh, DP or like DVP. Or especially like some of these books, po- some of these books, like, cause even not like I've Googled it, even if it's like not my book, cause I've, if I've been reading something, if it's like TVP or something and I'm like, what, you know, is they're <laughs> trying to describe it to me or whatever. But so it's like, if you actually Google it, it'd be like, it can work. It can work. 
Does it look like it's really pleasurable for any of them? I'm not convinced. <laughs> I'm not convinced, but it can anatomically work. Um, so yeah, I, yeah, you want to research things because for me, like for me, it's like, it has, it has to feel good. It has to, you know, and so I, I want it, the positions to make sense and I want them to not be, you know, like sometimes you'll see it and the guy's like dangling in the air. He has to be <laughs> held by a second person. He has to, you know, so I'm just like, what is going on here? Um, just but like yeah, a wheelbarrow. So it can work, it can work. <laughs> Like one of them has to be like suspended from a chain or something, um, which still can be fun. Um, but yeah, <laughs> on a completely non-sex related topic. Yeah, <laughs> do you? I know I'm going 180 here, but we were curious if you get inspiration for any of your characters, either from real life people. I know you mentioned your son for Jake. Um, mm-hmm. any of your other characters or just like people you've met? Yeah. I would say the the process the process of like characterization that I typically go through I talk about it in terms of layers. I have never it, my imagination doesn't work that way for me to just be like I shall pluck my friend <laughs> Tiffany out of the air and change her name to Courtney. Like that doesn't that doesn't happen um it kind of just like that's not fun for me. I love the process of characterization. And so it really is about like layers. And so I would say, or like even that, that was something strange when I first wrote Beautiful Things. I got a, several reviews where people would be like, well, this is an, you know, an author write in if I've ever seen one of like trying to say that like I wrote myself in as Rosalie. But it was very strange because it was just like, you don't know me. I'm a, no- <laughs> like, you don't know me. I'm a nothing author. Like this is my first book. It was like, we could not be more different, you know? So it's, it's very strange of like readers will be like, oh, oh, this has to be a write-in. I'm like, no, it's so far from the truth, you know? <laughs> but I would say all of, like all of my main characters, I give them something. I give them something of me that I can typically connect to. But then, yeah, I, all of my characters are just kind of mashups of all kinds of different things, different things, different people, but it will just be like little pieces of them. Like, like Jake, uh, an example I'll give is like Jake's fascination with pelicans or birds or the (laughs) fact that he will like, oh my God, there's a pelican, stop the car to take a picture. That's that's my husband and my dad and my grandpa. I joke that it's like something happens to men when they turn like 35, where a man who has never before had an inclination towards birding will suddenly get an interest in birds. My husband for you know 10 years of our marriage never showed an interest in birds and then it's like turns 35 and then it's like there's a blue jay you know it's like (laughs) oh there's a there's a red-tailed hawk on the fence you know and so it was like what is this but I saw the same thing happen with my dad and like my grandpa and it's like what is it with you guys and birds um so I gave that to Jake like it's the smallest of things but it's just like you weave that in and then you weave in ADHD for my son and you weave in you know, so it just kind of goes from there, kind of like some frat boy energy and you weave in, you know, um, and then you build the character. Um, but no, there's never, I really don't like doing like um, celebrity doppelgangers or whatever. It's like, what celebrity would you cast? I don't like doing that. Um, and I never, I never craft a character typically with like a celebrity in mind. The closest I've ever come would be like, a loose mainly it's Kevin Creekman's hair his hair and his beard and like when his face was in profile I was like oh yeah that's it um for one of my characters bear in my in my MMO megaverse um that's like the closest I've ever come it's like he's a model and he's pretty popular and a lot of people particularly in the book talk community have heard of Kevin Creekman yes um, that's like the closest I think I've ever come but again he's not a write-in in any sense of the word it was just like profile headshot that I found of him that I was like ah yes that looks really that that's the vibe I'm going for Um, yeah otherwise no we were gonna ask you about a cast so we're gonna scrap (laughs) that question (laughs) yeah no yeah it's just it's not it's just not really the way my imagination works if anything what I like to do is I like to scroll like Pinterest or Unsplash and I'll scroll like like, headshots so there'll be there'll be real people but they're not going to be like Chris Hemsworth, you know, um, that I'll find someone and be like, yes, this is it. Um, but there'll be headshots of real people that I'll find. And so then I'll like latch on to that headshot 
and be like, yes, this is the character. And I'll make mood boards. That'll be part of that, like the haunting process that I talked about. I will make, you know, every character will have like five different mood boards and I'll just go crazy of like images, images and music will really get those juices flowing. Um, when I'm feeling like I'm ready to write, you know, that it wants to come out of me. So be prepared to be sick of me in terms of mood boards of fucking sweet because I have so <laughs> many mood boards. We're so, so excited many. for it. Yeah. yeah, I have so many. <laughs> um, so <laughs> something else that you're super good at is making nicknames for your characters. <laughs> and talking about that frat boy energy, Chad yeah. McBoatface, you've got yeah. shiny abs McBuff boy. <laughs> So yeah. do you nickname people <laughs> in your real life and do you yourself have a nickname? Um, do I have a nickname? Um, yeah, I had actually uh all through high school I had a nickname. My friends, like my inner circle of friends, called me Bunny. B like bunny, like bunny rabbit. But the reason they did it is because I was such a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I had like such I had I have I have one of the worst cases of resting bitch face you'll ever see like like it was so bad it came up in my student reviews of like kind of kind of like you should smile more type thing or like she just looks like she's mean or she like it came up when I was a grad student it came up it came up in a class that I literally because the teacher just like never shut their mouth they just like wanted to hear themselves talk I think I probably opened my mouth like twice that whole semester because you could never get a word in edgewise it came up in my reviews that like I had a sullen disposition because I would be quietly listening to them the whole class you know what I mean but it's like yeah. just my face you know it's my face yeah 13 <laughs> years with my husband it's like every single day of my life I'm like what's wrong yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like now something's wrong because you asked me what's wrong. <laughs> um but yeah so they called me bunny uh to help offset my per- my perception to the world that I was That's unapproachable cute. and hard <laughs> uh, so they called me bunny um when we were first dating my husband's from Tennessee um and he had a much thicker accent I've unfortunately like beat it out of him I guess um (laughs) but he called me darlin without the g that was cute Um, that is cute yeah my family nickname they called me twiddlebug I don't know if you remember (laughs) from the Sesame Street because it's like the the twiddlebugs live in Ernie's like flower pot (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know like on his windowsill but they're just like kind of like the lemmings where it's like the there's something like twiddle bugs work and work all day they have no time for play or something like that because I just like <laughs> never stopped moving I never stopped you know it's like I, I didn't nap it was just like I was awake and then I was moving um and it still fits I guess so yeah the family <laughs> called me twiddle bug <laughs> nicknames uh doesn't sound very sexy it's not supposed to be (laughs) um but no nicknames are fun I love I love coming up with nicknames and I feel like the sillier the better it's just a way I feel like that like the books especially the Rays series it's a way of like nothing's getting taken too seriously you know if you have people just wander around being like hey there's hottie mccott abs or like chad (laughs) mcboat face you know yes it's just funny a laugh out loud funny when nikki and i first read that one night we were on a cruise together we're sitting on the balcony and she's over (laughs) next to me like hysterically laughing i'm like what are you laughing at and then i would get to the parts with the nicknames too i'm laughing out loud it's the nicknames (laughs) are so funny (laughs) yeah it's a lot of fun and then i'll yeah i'll come up with them and sometimes it's like i'll just sometimes I'll run them by people, you know, like which one's funnier, you know? (laughs) Um, Yeah, it is fun. I was surprised with Pucking Wild. I had multiple people say they did not like his nickname that she called him Puffy. Oh, really? And that surprised me because I was like, come on. I loved it. It was so cute. It was perfect. I know. Yeah, it fits him. Yeah. Okay, okay. I'll tell them. Hold on. Hey, besties. Future Nikki here. I'm sorry to have to do this to you. We're going to have to break this podcast into two parts. Make sure you stay with us and come back next week for part two of Emily's interview. And don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe. And also turn on that notification bell. So that way you're always up to date with Bessie's books and groups. Bye.